We have spoken uh, uh, over the last uh, day about how uh, design has really risen and, and taken uh, center stage uh, in business and in technology, and we're really pleased to have one of the people who has helped to really make that happen. Uh, he's often referred to as one of the rock stars uh, of design, and he's been involved in so many influential uh, design projects and, and uh, companies and investments over the years, so we're thrilled to have you, Tony. Thanks well, thank for, you. Uh, coming. Thanks for having I wonder, me. Maybe we could start just by, uh, for people who may not know, let's see if we can make this work. Am I clicking up the slides here? Are we getting these? Wherever images? they there are. We are. Okay. Oh, there they are. Yeah, so there uh, are some logos of some of the, uh, you know, some touchstones uh, for, for Tony. Um, you know, it's an amazing thing for a designer to be able to make something that billions of people touch and have in their hands. And iPod, iPhone, Nest, all these amazing, uh, really breakthrough products. Um, and now you're in Paris. I'm in Paris. <laughs> Tell us yeah. a little bit about that and, and how you decided to go from Silicon Valley to Paris. Well, it actually started well before moving to Paris. So after my wife and I retired from Apple, we went around the world. And one of the places we stopped was Paris. And through that, that journey, we met a lot of people in Paris, and we were there for about eight months. And what we had learned was we saw this kind of burgeoning ecosystem and those things. But when we were also traveling around the world, we lived in homes all around the world with our kids, because they were one and two. We, we retired to be with them. And so when I was in all these homes, and then when we were in Paris, I saw all the problem, the same problems in, in homes in Spain, in Europe, in, in Southeast Asia, all these different places. And I said, That's the, that was the idea for Nest. Because everybody had the same energy problems, yeah. the same control yeah. problems, they had all the same products made by the same companies, and they hadn't evolved. And so if it wasn't for getting out of the valley, the ideas for Nest and the, the, you know, the genesis of it would have never happened because I was in Silicon Valley. So I, it, I took it upon our, myself and our family to always get out there and get in the world so we could learn from the problems other people have. And then all of a sudden you start to say, everybody has these problems. And so then after we wrapped up with Nest, then we moved to Paris, right? Because we wanted to get out again to learn from the world. And now we're also traveling to Southeast Asia with the family and learning about problems here and then going back to Paris. So again, it's always this search for more things that, to help for inspiration, to find problems to solve, to then bring it back into our daily, our daily work and the companies that we it's help. It's so rare, so unusual. I uh, want to maybe uh, see if you can talk a little bit about your current uh, project, uh, Future Shape, because people may not be as, am I clicking? The big green the, button. The big green. <laughs> having problems <laughs> oh, there's, with that. There's there are some of these stuff. iconic Yeah, we can uh, go products. through that. That's um, stuff. OK, so, so now uh, you uh, are leading Future Shape, which, uh, as we were chatting a little bit before, a lot of people misunderstand as a venture fund. It's really not. Tell us about it. It's not a venture fund. So what Future Shape is, and something I've been doing for eight years to 10 years now, depending on how you count, is really about helping entrepreneurs who are doing very hard problems. These are hard problems. These are not social mobile and how fast can we go in 18 months or three years. These are hard technologies that we want to bring out of the lab and into your life, right? Things that we think are going to dramatically change the, the way we live for the better to help the environment, to help society. So we're invested in over 200 companies around the world, not just in wow. a lot in the US, but we're on three continents of where our investments are working with the best entrepreneurs, and what we're doing is we're working with them because they have great technology that can be disruptive. And what we do is we don't come in as a venture capitalist. We don't have any LPs. We don't have any of this. But yeah. we can write very large checks. And what we come in with is not just money. What we say to them is we give you money to hire us to help you. And what we do is we literally help them because a lot of these things are uh, dramatically different technologies. We help them with all the communications and the product market fit and how to go about mm. telling the stories yeah, yeah. around these technologies to get the world to understand them. Because most of the time, they're trapped in a lab or they just get out of the lab and they get licensed by a large corporation. They don't know what they're doing with them. So what right. we want to do, and you saw that like Impossible Foods yeah. and stuff like yeah. that, yeah. and they had a great event last night. They have a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, coming out today here for Southeast Asia. But um, literally, it's all about helping them communicate and helping them find the networks using and, and being with them for the 7, the 10, the 12 years, patient, patient capital, 
pay, and mentorship. We never, we never lead, we don't take board seats. So we're not angels with a little check. Right. We are literally large, large checks, but we're involved. So this is I call them, we, t we talk, wow. we're, we're always on things. So something like Rohini, who's yeah. changing fundamentally how we do light, or impossible, you know, meat without a cow, right? Really helping the environment, phenonic. Literally getting rid of compressors in the world. All compressors that have incredible uh, greenhouse gas problems yeah. and, and reliability and energy problems, turning it into solid state, like going from the vacuum tube to the transistor. These are kind of things that are, take a long time and take lots of partners to do, but if you don't have that kind of knowledge of, of the technology and how to transform that into products, and not just products, but products with incredible stories to tell to get other investors involved, that's what we're about. Mm. Working with them to bring it out of the lab and into their lives, into so, our lives. So that's, that's really uh, unique because you're working not just on the design side, but you're trying to figure out how to make the funding side work and the marketing and the... Uh, the yeah, because that, over my career, you know, I always learned that like the first thing is, oh, here's a cool technology, we can make a product. Yeah. Now, who's it for? Right. Oh, then how do we market it? Right. Right? How do we, like, it's all of those things. So it's like, wait a second, let's start really early before they can hire those consultants, they, before, before anybody was like, uh, why am I going to work with them? I need, yeah. I, you know, everyone's yeah. got their, their role to play, but they don't want to play so early because it seems like it needs five, seven years before they're going to actually get involved. Right so we bring the most best professionals, because we have offices in Paris and San Francisco, to come in and work with them to help them realize the, uh, the, the benefits of that technology in many markets they may never even thought of. So you mentioned you're spending a lot more time now in Asia these days. I wonder if we can pull yeah, that up. Yeah, here you go. Share with us, if you can, some of your impressions and what you're learning uh, in, in Asia. I mean, it's, it's so unusual that you're, you know, you've emerged from the valley, you're now, you've got one foot in, in Paris, and now you're paying attention to yet this whole new uh, region. What are, you, what are you seeing, what are you learning? Well, you know, I had to change my brain when I just, you know, these are the different home screens from different countries. Yeah. You can maybe guess where these home screens come from. But this is really about what people do to their phones, an iPhone obviously, and how they have to customize the interface. There's one interface that comes out of Cupertino, yeah. right? It comes out of the box the same way. But be, if you want to really actually adapt that product to that, that region, I have to go and change my brain. So it's like, when I'm in the States, I'm doing SMS and calls. When I'm, when I'm in Europe, I'm doing a different thing you know, and right. I'm not necessarily calling. I'm, I, and when I'm here, I always have to be on WhatsApp. There are no calls. There are no SMSs. You can't even get a voice package. It's all right. internet data package. If you want voice and SMS, that's like down the chain. You have to go search for it. So you have to actually change your brain and think about the real culture and what they do every day. And, and, and actually, have to, I have to have different home screens, right, when yeah. I move around the world. Right. And so that just gives you... As a designer, as a you know, as a uh, as an investor, to understand that you have to think very differently and think very locally when you come in and work with people. Yeah, and so it's it's fascinating, it's wonderful, and uh, you know, it just stretches your brain in the best way. So people in, in different regions uh, are are kind of using different operating systems on many levels. I mean, they have the different operating systems on their phones, but those operating systems force them or you know encourage them to organize their lives in different uh, ways. And as a product designer, that's very important, right? <laughs> exactly, and it's not just organizing from a, maybe a communications perspective, but also from a finance perspective. How do we, like, am I using a credit card or am right. I using an e-wallet, which one? They might not have even had a bank account before. So you have, to, you have all different fundamentals from where they're coming from and you have to live that. And so it's great when we come here with our family and we, like, it's like we gotta throw away all the credit cards, we gotta throw everything in, we gotta think differently as a family. And then we work as a family together to like figure this stuff out. Hmm. And so we have a whole new way of living. We can't just, you know, we can still get Netflix here, which is great, so you get a little bit of that, but you really have to live a different life and you think differently. And it's great because for me, especially, you know, for me it's selfish, but for the family, I get our kids to really have a very dynamic range of how different people live in the world and how they could have choices as they grow up. It's not just one way. So I'm, I'm curious, are you, as you sort of absorb all these differences and, and learn more about them, are you thinking that these are uh, references that will help you to invest in Western markets or are you looking at uh, investment opportunities 
in Asia as well, or do you think it's possible? A lot of people say that it, there's really no way that, that non-Asian companies can crack into some of these Asian markets. What, what's your view on that? Oh, no, I think it, 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 it all crosses. Uh -huh. It all crosses. People want to say that, but it's crossing. I'm seeing our, our European investments wanting, and we're helping them get to the U.S. I'm yeah. seeing U.S. investments wanting to get here. We have Canadian investments who are doing a lot of business in Southeast Asia, where we're in aquaculture, uh -huh. in very eco-friendly eco aquaculture stuff. But they're doing sensors and data helping shrimp aquaculture or, or other kinds of fish aquaculture. So, so to have that perspective when you're dealing with these startups and you're able to then move around the world and give them your perspective as an investor or as a business person, marketing person, it really helps because we're bringing business models or marketing models from over here and helping them and seeding them over here or vice versa or getting huh. investors from over here to take them over there. So it's, it's really this... Um, uh, array, vast array of different pieces that we put together to then try to optimize. Huh. Do, you, so. do you see these systems uh, sort of converging uh, at some point, uh, or do you see them, uh, I mean, there is an argument uh, that, that we're kind of splitting into these sort of different techno blocks around the world. That I, I think that, you know, if you look at evolution, Evolution has diversity in different parts of the world. I think we're going to have the same thing going huh. on here. You know, India is very different from Southeast Asia, which is very different from China, yeah. which is different in Europe. So, so if you're not thinking that way and you're not adapting to that local culture, you're never going to do that. Now, you see, like, Netflix is coming and they're into India, and they have to get all Indian, yeah. you know, based content. Of course you have to do that. But you also have to change the interface, like I showed on the... Yeah. You know, right? So I don't think we're going to just have this homogeneity. I think that's what is... You know, we have to have that diversity because that's what actually drives us to, to find more innovations. If we become homogenous, then it's, you know, you only get to a local maximum. I like all kinds of different local maximums all around so that we can find more of them. Interesting. Um, I want to, I know you're spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the environment, and that's one of the issues that we have uh, really uh, highlighted this year in talking about how designers can help there. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're working on there and, and, and your interests and, and how you got into it. Well, you know, I started out recycling in the 80s at school when I was in university. Yeah. And I was doing solar panels as my, you know, solar panels as my uh, science project uh, and went to the science fair um, back in the 70s. So it's always been a part of uh -huh. me. I've, nature was always it. But, you know, you hear a lot of things in the media like, oh, and you're, you're doing the recycling, you're doing all this stuff. But until I actually came to Southeast Asia, right, uh -huh. and you see the trash, yeah. and you see what global corporations do, and they say, well, it's their problem. We're just going to bring all this plastic. We're going to bring this stuff, and they'll have to figure out how to deal with it, right? Because there is no recycling. And even if there was recycling, it still gets burned or buried. It doesn't get recycled. And so I'm like, why? why? I keep asking why all of these questions. And when you see it in front of you, and your kids are surfing on the beach, and you're, you're in it, right? you start going, as designers, we designed this world. Yeah. Okay, we created this. We need to think much more broadly about where this stuff is coming from that we use to put into our designs and where it goes. Mm. Because we're the only ones who are gonna get us out of this and that's gonna be the designers and the engineers and the CEOs who are driving their operations department to go, no, we're gonna invest in these new technologies, these new things, because we are damaging the health of our customers. Mm right, and our future customers. Hmm. And so when you see it 100% in your face every day, and we live with it, and our kids live around it, you know, when we're here for a month at a time or whatever, you start going, we got some, we got a real problem, we got a fix. Whoops. We made it. I get this. <laughs> I'm not very good at running this clicker, am I? Uh, you've, you've brought us a, a short uh, clip on plastics. I wonder if we could just yeah, let's, show let's that. Yeah, let's do and it. We, can, we get that we up. There we are. Incredible, moldable indestructible material. But when we dump it, it doesn't go away. Now one truck of it ends up in our oceans every minute. It's killing sea life. The fish eat the trash, then we eat the fish. We're feeding ourselves our own garbage, and it's now in our bloodstreams. We've got to avoid plastic, we've got to get it out of the ocean, and reuse it. Look, what if we took some trash and made a sports shoe out of it? And then we made a million more from 11 million plastic bottles. 
What if that was just the start? And what if everyone did that? Great. So you want to tell us a little bit about where this is from? And kind yeah, of so the... this is obviously Adidas and, and Parley, who they go and take ocean plastic and they right. turn it into right. products. Actually, it's so successful that they can't get enough good enough recycled material to actually make enough, they make enough product because the customers are really embracing this and they're starting to see it, especially people who live a live around it. And so this is just one example where they're taking bold steps at very large corporations and pushing their operations teams to do this stuff. Yeah. You know, when I look at different companies, even Walmart's really trying to do this compared to Amazon. Amazon's, you know, greenwashing, right. where Walmart's doing it. You need business leaders to go and say, this is important for the health of our customers not just the planet, but the health of our customers. And they're doing a great job of it. We need more technologies like this. And so we're doing the counter investment strategies that happens in most VCs, which is these are materials and material sciences. Most yeah. people will not even go near it, mm -hmm. right? They won't go near recycling. We're saying it's going to be, and we, people are going to be um, saying to themselves, what are we doing in the environment sooner or later? And I know we had our, you know, the, the kind of the green uh, blowout in 2008 and everything. It was right. like all these right. investors got in and, and then, then it, they it blew up. Yeah. We, are, we are on that precipice now mm. where we have the millennials, we have new generations who are demanding it. We see what's happening in the U.S. with AOC. We're seeing what's going yeah. on in Europe. Right. We're seeing kids walking out around the world saying, we got to fix it. This is going to be an amazing, amazing investment strategy because we're only doing the right thing, hmm. right? Hmm. And so I think, you know, obviously I'm biased, but if we're not doing this, we, we're not going to have a planet. And so if I, I think about it, you know, people are like, well, you have no LPs, you have no, so you can do whatever you want. Right. My LPs are my kids, and yeah. my kids <laughs> don't need money, they need an yeah. earth, yeah. right? So we were talking with, with Tim uh, yesterday about you know, wicked problems, and, and plastic is definitely one wicked problem. Oh, that's um, just one of them. Uh, t technologically, uh, I mean, you spend a lot of time thinking about this. Is it really possible to get plastic out of the manufacturing system? No, it's what you need to do is you need to treat it correctly. You need it to treat it correctly and change the plastics themselves fundamentally. And, you know, we don't need absolute pure plastic to make these bottles. Mm. People think they do yeah. because that's what they're comparing. They're like, unless it's exactly like this, I can't yeah. use it. Yeah. You can use different grades of it and you can still get great material properties. You can get great products that can be biodegradable and compostable. Yeah. But you have to change the way you think about what you need. And people are like, well, if I can't have an exact copy, yeah. then I can't do it. And it has to be an exact copy that has to be the same price. Huh. We need to change our brains to go, no, this was a technology for that time, but that is gone now. We huh. have to think differently. And the designers have to push it, and the CEOs have to push to, when you can't get the material, push the, the supply chain to make it, to yeah. figure it out and invest in it, right? At Apple, we actually had, to, when we wanted to do certain technologies, we had to go all the way to manufacturing, all the way to the raw materials, and invest in those to get the quantities we needed to make the difference in the world. We couldn't just go, oh, okay, we can't buy it, so we're gonna move on. Right, right. right. It's interesting, though, as I listen to you describe that uh, you know, uh, market landscape, it sounds like you're, you're very concerned that right now the way in which sort of capitalism and the venture capital system and the funding mechanisms work don't provide the right incentives for uh, designers, for engineers, for, for technologists to tackle those problems. Well, you're right. I think, you know, unfortunately, you know, one of the things I got to be involved with, which was the iPhone, right, yeah. has made all these investors around the world and yeah. corporations around the world drunk on yeah. the fact that there was this incredible change in society over the last right. 10 years. Incredible. It's not going to happen again. And they're looking for it again. And they're not seeing what's going to happen because it's so far away yeah. from where it is. And it takes longer to make, right? right? It takes right. longer. Look, Silicon Valley didn't happen because everybody got three-year returns. <laughs> it happened. Apple took how many years to yeah. make the IBM? How many years to make those yeah. fundamental changes to then start this thing? Yeah. So we have to go back to those long plays. But these plays are 100x kind of returns. 500x kind of returns, yeah. oh. right? I want to take some questions from the audience, but just quickly I want to ask you one thing, which is uh, also a hot topic here for us. 
Uh, and that's this question of um, uh, uh, you know, whether we need, as designers, uh, a kind of an ethical code of some sort. Um, you've been involved in making uh, some of these incredibly uh, I mean, useful, convenient, in many ways addictive <laughs> gadgets, uh, things with sensors that are capable of absorbing uh, a ton of information about the individual, uh, depending on how they're used. Um, does it worry you? I mean, some of these arguments about uh, we're creating the system of surveillance capitalism, where we sure. we entice people to give away their privacy without really understanding the consequences of that. Tell us your your thinking on that on that debate. Well. First of all, you know, when the iPhone came out, right, it, we didn't have any idea that people were going to exploit it the way it was done, right? <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's usually not the iPhone that's addictive. Right. It's the things that people put on them. And so it, you know, it's a, it's a conduit, but it isn't the somebody, you know, if you look at most of the Apple apps on there, they're not addictive unless you really want to do email all day, right? right? That's not where it's at, you know. It's, it's a refrigerator, and you can choose to put in your refrigerator fruits and vegetables, or you can put lots of desserts and everything else that you crave. And most of the stuff that Apple brings out is not the desserts, right? Yeah. It's going to be, it's all the fundamentals. So, so we're in a, a place of unintended consequences, but now it's those conduits who have the responsibility to go in and, and really self-police and to make that happen. You know, when I, when I look at the difference between how Steve thought about things and I looked at very young entrepreneurs thinking about things, Steve had the ability over 20, 30 years to really process what they were doing and he had kids. Yeah. Most of the entrepreneurs, yesterday I was at one, you know, a very large startup here and I asked, how many of you have kids? And almost to like two people out of this, this room of 500 people had kids. Oh. And so if you don't have kids and you don't understand that you're designing for those kids and those families and you know, for seven generations and what, what it means, you have no basis. So you're just following along what everybody else is doing. When I watched Steve, he was very clear about what was going to be in the app store, what was going to be in the content, and what wasn't going to happen. And it's like, it's for us to decide, right? It's not just a free-for-all. Whereas when I watched other entrepreneurs with very large companies, they started and they said, oh no, everybody should have anything they want, whatever. And then when they got kids, they go, wait a second, I'm at home and I have to police this. I have to figure it out. And they started changing things, but they already unleashed this beast on the world right. and they're trying to reel it back in. And so, you know, um, being young is great, but I think we need to have, as designers and everything, bring in back to understand it's not just about the inv individual. It's about our society, but really about the family. And if you think more family-wise when it comes to design, yeah. you're going to think about your progeny, and you're going to think about how what you're doing now affects that, those, those subsequent generations. So it's like the system needs kind of more parental controls in a way, right? If we're not going to do that ourselves, yeah. right, then you know, maybe the government will, but we have to. We, we absolutely have to, and each of us has to take that into, into the way we think about designing the products, designing the ecosystems, and designing our businesses. Mm. Questions here? Uh, Alan? Can I, can I yeah, sure. So, uh, oh, thank you. You've covered an awful lot of ground very quickly, which is great. But okay. <laughs> you, one of the things you said in passing was Amazon is greenwashing, Walmart is really doing it. It's, it's hard for those of us on the outside to always distinguish between what is greenwashing and what is really doing it. So I wonder if you could elaborate on that, on how you make that decision. Well, you just look real quick. If you're expanding like crazy, if you're expanding like crazy and you're, you're delivering and you're buying trucks, are you buying electric trucks or are you buying regular diesel trucks, mm. right? What are you doing for your fuel source? What are you doing for all of these different things? So it's really about going back and saying, how are they investing? Because these investments are going to last 5, 10 years, 15 years. They're setting, up, they're setting up their infrastructure for years to come. So if you think you're going to fix things in 2030, you've got to fix them now to, to actually see the change back, see the change then. So you really need to look at what are people really buying and putting in as infrastructure, and then say, Is it, are they going to actually be able to meet those goals? Right? And, and what are they doing with transparency? Walmart is, Walmart is and Amazon isn't. Yeah, what, what is Walmart doing that... Uh, well, if you look, they're actually pushing all kinds of packaging changes to the supplier saying, I'm not going to take it unless you do this, right? You have to then push 
and, 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 and the problem is, is if you don't have these large comp companies all pushing, then it's going to be a free rider thing. Whereas the people who are trying to make the change, the other ones are going to just say, I'm going to keep doing it the old way, mm. right? So I look at it, and you know, we heard about the rumor that Amazon's going to make its own stores, not Whole Foods. And, and I read, and I think I read it in one of your things, it was like, read, read, read carefully. What does, Wal Wal uh, what does Whole Foods not sell? Junk food. So they're going to decide to start selling more junk food because that's what people want. So, so it's like, OK, so what is the process here? Are we really just about capitalism, or are we thinking about larger you know, circular economy kind of things? So that's the, you have to look at, at, at the fundamentals and not just look at the marketing. Really interesting. Uh, other questions? Did we have? I saw a couple of hands here. No questions? There you go, sir. Yeah, please. Maybe I'm scaring everyone. <laughs> I've got one over here to your right. Um, so okay. when you talk about um, some of these choices, some of these are also cultural. And so as you've been jumping around the world, do you, see, uh, do you see cultures more or less aligned to those kinds of values? Because choosing to take a long-term view or to do, some of these things start to get to sort of cultural norms around values and ethics. Right. And how, does, how do you see that playing out? Well, I think, I, I think you, you have to go in locally and you have to understand those communities. You also have to remember that a lot of these communities are trying to emulate the other things they see, right? And it's our, it's our job and it, it, the people who are creating these things to say what we think is right. And I understand that's kind of like we're going to go in and, and design what we think is right or what's wrong. But we have to have uh, empathy for what where they came from, and not just give them what we think is right. We have to go and say, what are we doing to that community? What are we, what, what will they, maybe they want things that the Western world wants, but let's do it in a responsible way to understand what they have. Do they have all these other facilities around them to do the recycling or to, to collect these things? So you really have to go in and, and, you know, how can I put it this way? So Steve always said, if you really believe in what you're doing and you can communicate it, you can get people to change your behavior, be, their behavior, mm -hmm. right, for the good. If you just give them what they want and give them that, in, you know, that dopamine hit because you're giving them more sugar or you're giving them more you know, um, FOMO or whatever it is, that's, that's not the right thing. You have to go in and go, no, that's not the way I would want to live. That's not the, I want, the, the world I want my kids to live in. So we have to think differently about that. So yes, you're, and, and if you do the right marketing and you tell the story and you make it emotional and rational, you can get people to switch and, and change. But you've got to change with understanding the local values and the local customs and those things and not just, just um, assume you're going to just copy and paste and they're going to just move to that. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. This is a fascinating conversation. Tony, I want to thank you for coming and, and joining us, uh, and uh, hope that people get a chance to maybe talk to you in the, yeah, in the break right and, and hear more about your ideas. But uh, thank you so much. Please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Tony.